没什么问题。What's the name of the practicando five? Just asking how you are. Good. How are you? Good. All right.、Um, do you guys want to wait a couple minutes, or do you want to get started? I feel like we'll get some people while I do my introduction. Get started. Yeah. All、They're、right.、Ready. So, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us on live on Instagram、uh, from the Tandem Press Studio at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, my name is Olivia Cipriano, and I am the manager of programs and operations at the Hudson River、U、Museum. And、uh, welcome to a very special program,、uh, live from Tandem Press: The Making of Derek Adams' Self-Portrait on Float. So, with our special guests,、um, we have the master printers Jason Rule and Joe Frey, who will、uh, discuss and demonstrate the、uh, process of making this signature work of art.、Um, Basically, from the breakdown of the image to creation、um, of the puzzle cut locks to the inking and all the printing and all that fun stuff.、Um, but before we get started, I just want to、uh, say a couple thank yous、um, to whoever, everyone who made this program possible,、um, including you guys, the audience.、Um, but I also want to give a big thanks to Derek Adams and his incredible exhibit,、uh, Buoyant, which is actually currently featured at the Hudson River Museum. Uh, through August twenty third, I also, of course, want to thank Jason, Joe, and all the staff at Tandem Press.、Um, I also really want to give a big thanks to our exhibition sponsors.、Um, I have them written down right here, so give me a second.、Uh, notably, Dr. Sharon Brangman, Charlie Lester, Cheryl Calgary, Michael Ho,、um, Wayne and Phillips, Caroline Wamsler, PhD.、Um, Lisa Simonetti, Robin Jenkins, Everett Taylor, and、uh, all friends who at the museum. If there is、uh, anyone in the audience who would like to,、uh, you know, support these future programs, anyone who enjoys these,、um, you can please donate to our annual fund, Hudson River Museum's annual fund,、um, which can be found in the Instagram bio、um, of. The Hudson River Museum. So that's Hudson River Museum. No spaces. It is the live feed that we are on currently.、Um, just go to our main page here on Instagram, and、uh, you can click the link in our bio.、Um, it would be super appreciated. And also, just you know, if you can't, thank you just for being here.、Um, so a little bit of background on our presenters: Jason Rule and Joe Frey.、Um, Jason receives his BFA from. Minnesota State University Mankato and his MFA from the University of Wisconsin Madison.、Um, he has been a master printer at Tandem Press since 2008 and its studio manager since 2013. Joe Frey、uh, received his BFA from Western Michigan University, after which he attended the、uh, Ter Tamarind <laughs> Institute of Lithography for a whole year of training. He is, was a master printer、um, and studio manager at Segura Publishing in Tempe, Arizona, from 1995 to 2000. But since then, he has been at Tandem Press as a master printer.、Um, Jason and Joe, along with other artisans at Tandem Press, have been collaborating with Derek Adams to create these original prints for his Floaters series, starting with Self Portrait on Float, based on.、Uh, Derek Adams painting Floater 80, a self-portrait、um, created in 2009, to create this artwork. Nearly a hundred individual blocks of wood were carved、um, for 30 different colors, and gold leaf and paper fingernails were collaged into each impression. You'll be able to view this print, the focus of today's program, when we open the museum later this month. So yes, we are opening later this month,、um, and、um, with all that. Jason and Joe, take it away. This is、uh, your show. So we're going to try and stay 
six feet apart from each other, so there might be some times where one of us is on camera, one of us is off. You might hear a voice uh, from the background, and we'll try not to talk over each other too much. Try. Try. Um, yeah, so I guess the first thing we're going to start with is um, the beginning of breaking down the image. And Joe and I, um, after we had decided that we were going to work with Derek and he had given us the, the flow of image to work from, we knew that we were going to probably do this as a puzzle block woodcut. Um, you know, we thought of other techniques, but this one just seemed like that would be the, the best way to go about it. Um, so the first thing that we did is we drew the, the image of Illustrator. Um, because we knew that we were also going to be using a laser engraver to cut the blocks. And so you have to have a vector file to send to a laser engraver. So that was kind of the first initial step. And then we printed the image out, and I can let Joe kind of talk about what we did once we printed that image out. Um, this is a digital image, so it's not intended to be a color match to the final printing, just so you can see where everything is going on. And once Jason passed this off to me, my bit of the puzzle was to figure out how many blocks we could get away with doing this print in. Um, because it's a puzzle block, none of the shapes can touch each other. Um, or you'll get a white line around each shape. So I don't know if you can zoom in enough, Seth, to see, but there's a number one up in the background, so all of that went on the first block. Um, and then number two, just we started picking it apart, just sort of biggest shapes, trying to block it out, and it ended up being six blocks. Some of these shapes are really small, like these little nostrils, which went on block six. Um, so yeah, it ended up that we could do it in six runs, which is not daunting. A hundred pieces is somewhat daunting, but yeah, that's where we started. And then the other thing that we kind of knew right away is that um, with the horn and the tooth that were in the image, we, we were going to do those as gold leaf that we would collage on. And the chain. Um, and the chain. Um, one of the reasons being is because we really wanted that to have a shiny look and Usually in printing, like ink just doesn't want to be quite that shiny. Uh, and we had seen, you know, with some of Derek's paintings that, you know, there were fabric pieces that were collaged onto them, things like that. So it made sense to do that well to us. So after we initially, you know, we broke down this thing into the six different runs, then we had to cut all of the blocks. So I've got the laser engraver set up that I can um, cut one shape really quickly. It's just going to be kind of this uh, piece that's on the inside of the ear that I can show you. So if you want to go over, just walk over to the laser. Yeah, I'll send it from here. Okay. Joe, can you turn the uh, thing on the uh, floor? Joe was kind of talking about with that white line that would occur between shapes. That's happening because you're losing just a little bit of width of this piece of wood when that laser cuts it away. So it's called the curve. So you also have to think about that in terms of like how the shapes are going to line up from block to block. I 
think so, yeah. Yeah, so the first piece that it cut was a part of the main, and now it's going to cut the inside of that ear. Wow, what is that? M grain wood? Plywood? Uh, it's MDF that we're using. Match them up to the. Yeah. Those would have been. Is that right? Uh, it's reversed. Yeah. 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 Those would have been that shape and that shape. So there's a hundred of these little pieces that make up the print. I know, Seth, if you want to start by over here and go in order, we can talk about this was the first run, just this background, and then this. And they all look very weird. I mean, this looks sort of slightly clown face ish, but it does while you're printing as well. And then it starts to build, and that's the third block, fourth block, fifth block, and that's the final block, all of which. Weirdly adds up to that. And if people have questions, feel free to ask as we're going along for these type of things. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you if I see one. So then we can also just show you like a quick build up of the image. So that would be the first run. Then you get the second run. Then you get the third run. Then you get the fourth run, the fifth run, and then the last run. Uh, yeah, we coated um, the MDF with shellac before we did the printing. So now what we're going to do is um, we're going to actually go over and ink some of the blocks up. And uh, we're going to ink up blocks for this piece that we're currently working on with Derek, which is another float image. Um, just because we, you know, we printed the unicorn float quite a while ago. But since we're in production on the swan float, we can actually show a run being added to the print. So the so there are six runs, but there are 30 colors. So you can do multiple colors on each block. That's why it's a puzzle block as well, is you can ink up, say, like if we look at this block right here, you can see how many different colors we were able to achieve on this run. So it's not six colors, it's six 
runs, but I think it was about 30 different colors. Yeah, because for instance, this shape, probably this shape, this shape, and several other shapes are all the same color. So they're on different blocks. But just because there's 100 shapes doesn't mean they're all 100. It's 100 different colors. Some of the shapes get used quite a lot. They just couldn't all go on the same block together. That's another way to do it, but it would have been 30 runs had we done it that way. Yeah. Get that thing out of there. So here at the top, this one has two runs, two or three, yeah, three runs on this one. And then this one has four. This one has five. This one has five. It's about to have six. And then, yeah, the sixth run will get printed on it. And so you can really see, like, this idea of puzzle block will probably make a little bit more sense right now. So you can see that Joe has all of these colors out, and they're each for separate blocks that he's inking up for the run that he's going to do. Right. And here you can see again that you know this shape, this shape, and this shape are all the same color. And this color, I'm going to ink four different shapes all the same color. I'll just ink a few of them up, some of them we started, just so y'all didn't have to sit here and watch all of them get inked up. This is a particularly tiny one. And then we'll go back in the puzzle block. Not always neatly. And so then this process has to happen every time that you print. So everything would be inked up, you would print the run, then you would take all the blocks out, re-ink them up, put them back in, and then print again. So you can only get one impression off of each round. Of paper. And then you can see up here, there are pins that are on here, and that is the registration system. So the paper all has been punched. So these holes will go on the pins, and that's how you lay the paper down on, on the block each time and make sure that it's in register. kind of ink are you using? Oil based. It's an ink you actually designed for lithography but it works equally well for the thicker the pieces. Uh, this is half inch MDF that we're using. Just because like quarter inch would be it wouldn't be bulky it enough, flat. it wouldn't stay flat if we were to do that, so that's why we use half inch. How do you decide what pieces to put in what box? So pieces can't touch on the same block. So if they're next to each other on the print, they have to be on separate blocks. Otherwise, there would be a white line in between the shapes. So that's how we decided to, you basically had to split the entire thing up into as many blocks as you could get all the pieces without touching each other on the same block. So you can see right here how they're they're all spaced These two out. These very nearly touch, but they don't. Yeah. There's something else that goes in between there. Same with that.
So now that he's got it on the pins, he'll just slowly lay it down. Put it in the press and it's going to get loud for a little while. How large is the addition? How many impression does each inking yield? So it's an addition of 30 and each inking is for one of the 30. So you have to ink up for, you know, plus there's proofs beyond the addition. So you would have to ink it up, you know, 40 plus times for the first run. For the second run, you do the same amount for the Third run, etc. How much pressure? About 12 tons of pressure. This has one more run to go after this. You probably noticed when you look at one of the frames that it's not quite finished. But like we were saying, yeah, now that I've printed it, um, these shapes all have to get inked up again if I were to print another one. I have to twist and frame up and start to take the shapes out. All of which will have to be moved again every time. It takes about a week to do one run, typically. So then you may have noticed on this print and on the uh, form that there were collage elements that were added to the print. So I can show you how we cut those collage elements before they go. So there are two collage elements for it. One is the shirt, which is printed on a book linen to give it a little bit of texture. And it's printed by a subscreen. And then there's a party hat that will go on, which is printed relief. And I'm going to cut the hat now. Someone wants to know how you clean the blocks, Joe. 
Well, you blot them several times through that press with newsprint to get most of the ink off, and then you clean them with just a rag and paint them. So, this is the party hat before it gets cut. Uh, and you'll notice that there's crop marks on here. And that is so that our digital plotter can register where to cut this party hat out. So once it's all ready to go, you just send it from the computer. And it starts to read the crop marks. It's ready to go. And it has uh, an acid-free dry mount tissue on the back of it. So it's a heat sensitive tissue that we mount it with. So then we'll position it where it needs to go. Use a tacking iron to put it in place. And then we have a large dry mount press that we would put it in and that would heat set it to the print. Um, so there are, are there other questions at this point about things? Nope, not so far. Because yeah, that's and that's kind of the really quick breakdown of kind of getting from the initial drawing that we started with into the print. But again, if anybody missed anything that they'd like us to talk about again, uh, we can definitely do it. Do you want to show how you do the chain necklace or the unicorn horn? Yeah, oh, somebody just asked what about the gold leaf? So we leafed paper and with two different types of leaf. So you can see that the gold is slightly different for both of these. And then with the chain, you can see that on the back, they're all interlocked. And then these also had dry mount tissue on them before they were cut. And then you would take it to the print. And it's a little big on both sides just because then we would mount it and then trim on the edges before mounting it right on this edge. So we could have a, you know, so we would make sure that it would go in the exact right spot. And then. And there's a tooth. The horn would go there. Yeah, let me, uh, let me see if I can grab a. What type of dry mount tissue? Uh, what is it called? It's called buffer mount. And then the tooth. So again, it's just a tissue that is heat sensitive. So that's the other reason we like it is because if you're using like a pressure sensitive glue, once you, you know, if you were to stick it down out of place slightly, it's really hard to get it back up. Whereas this, until you hit it with heat, it won't activate it. So, you know, it's very easy to move and put into place um, before actually tacking it down. Very disheartening to ruin a print by sticking something down in the wrong spot. Yes.
and then the uh, the fingernails were also collaged on to this. So these are printed on a really thin paper, uh, Kitakata, and then collaged on as well. So I want you to talk about how the project started. So the project started, um, our curators were in New York for the IFPA print fair, and we had talked with Derek a little bit about having him come in and, and make prints with us. Um, and so our, one of our curators, Mishka, did a studio visit with Derek and he expressed interest in how he would be interested in working on this image. Um, there was the painting that it's based on was in the studio. And so um, Mishka sent those photos back to us in the shop and right away we were just like, oh, definitely, like, we gotta do that print. Um, so then we just started to, again, like decide on what technique we thought would be the best technique and then reached out to Derek and told them kind of what we were thinking, you know, the scale that we thought would be a good scale. Um, and we knew again, because we were working with the laser engraver and the press that we were using, like kind of what our largest size would be. Um, so we pushed it to as, as big as we could. Bigger than we could, we ended up having a splice. And yeah, just so we could get a 40 inch square. Difference. Yeah, because this is, this is the height that would fit into the laser engraver. So we had to biscuit join pieces on the end of the MDF so we could, you know, make it the size that we wanted to. Um, can you guys describe what it was like working with Derek or the process of working with Derek a little bit? <laughs> Derek is so awesome to work with. Yeah, Derek is he's really great. Um, so we tried to get a proof on the wall like the first day that Derek came in just so we could, um, we could have something to talk about when he got to the shop instead of like taking two or three days of the visit to get to that point. Um, and we really like it was kind of down to the wire in terms of getting all the blocks prepped because it was a lot of work that went into it. And um, so we we got to this this run right here. And I don't know if I should. Yes, you should go ahead and tell the story. Right, so <laughs> so we get we get to five runs in, looking great. And we were so like kind of frazzled that we didn't realize that we not that we had never met Derek. Before. Yeah, we had never. This is the first day we've ever met Derek Adams. Like he just comes into our studio, and we printed this block backwards, upside down. Yeah. And so the head, you know, instead of being here, was here, and it was possibly the most disheartening thing was ever. And Derek was just like, "Oh, it's cool." He's like, I know what's going to happen. He's like, this is great. You guys are awesome. I mean, it was, it was so amazing because instead of him just being like, oh, I can't believe I flew all the way out to Wisconsin to work with these people that just printed this thing backwards, like he was super chill about it. And like that just, I mean, the rest of the visit was amazing. And he gave a talk while he was here to students and it was, yeah, it was really great. Uh, and so then, you know, after working with him on this, that's how we just ended up kind of continuing, um, continuing working with them, like working on this next float image, uh, working on the party image, and then we also have four um, style variations that we're working on um, with him as well. I think there's maybe one that's kind of in process in the rack over here. Um, somebody asked, what's the largest print that we could print in the studio? Probably pull off bigger than four by eight, but not a lot bigger. Yeah. You can show them that big etching press, and you can get a, you can get a sense of scale. The biggest print you've ever made was that Gilliam that goes on forever, but that was <laughs> a little unusual. I had a whole maker set up above the press just to have continuous fabric while they were running the print. But this is, this is an etching press. And scale six feet tall so it's a big one of the bigger etching presses that we know of in, in the country yeah i think it's roughly the bed is like 12 by five it's five by 12 yeah i'm pretty sure nobody's pushed it quite that far not in a while anyway we do a decent amount of prints at the roughly four by eight We 
you can't do that in the laser. And you can do multiple blocks and put them together, I suppose, to dial it. The registration will become yeah. nightmarish. Uh, that wasn't a custom press, was it? Yeah, well, uh, oh, yes, it was a custom press. So this is the one of the style variations that we're working on right now. And that is a combination of um, high voltage jet and screen printer. That has about six runs on it, and I'd say it has probably about four more runs that will go on after that. So this is the screen for the run that he just finished, which is right there. Um, how long does it take the ink to dry in between runs? Just yeah. Yeah, so I water based ink, so it dries quickly compared to the oil based ink, which will dry for literally weeks before it's truly dry. Yeah, I mean, by the time you get from the you know the bottom of the rack to the top, the bottom is probably dry when you're doing the screen. Do you know the screen mesh count? Uh, I think it might be two, no, 305. 305. How do you determine whether to do wood block versus screen print? <laughs> what we usually do when we have a, that when we're working on a print that's from an existing image or based on an existing image that somebody sends us is usually we get an idea what scale they want it and we print it out digitally and tag it to the wall and just live with it for sometimes for a couple of weeks and sort of talk amongst ourselves about well, what do you think? Why do you think that? And you know, we usually arrive at a consensus. Um, Derek, we just did it that way because we weren't really doing a lot of silk screen at that point. Patrick hadn't started when we when we started on the on the unicorn, and it's also a very different ink film relief ink versus silk screen. You can't see that on this Instagram thing, but the silkscreen ink film tends to be sort of finer and flatter, whereas that relief film, if you were here and could see it, that's really a juicy ink film on that block that I just printed, and it's not that either one of those things is bad or good, but it's very different. And the amount, you know, the amount of colors that are in, say, the uniform float versus some of these other ones, like, we took that into consideration as well in terms of like how many screens it would take because that one again, like in the one run, we could get eight colors, whereas screen print, you're going to do one color at a time. And we hadn't done a puzzle block of anywhere near this complexity when we decided to do it this way. So there were some things that we had to kind of dial in. We started with a different material that wouldn't stay flat, and you know, but that's pretty typical. I mean, we're always sort of pushing. Um, how much time passed between meeting Derek and the completion of Self Portrait? Uh, I believe he was here in April of 20, 2019, and we finished in August of 2019. Yeah, we were not in production that entire time. I don't think. Yeah, there were some 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 breaks in that time, but roughly that amount of time, just because. You know, we have other things in the production schedule when the artist comes in, so we'll stop production on everything during the artist's visit. And then once the artist leaves, we'll put the print away with notes and go back to it when it kind of comes into the schedule. We don't necessarily just do that print right after the artist leaves. Right. 
So somebody is asking, what, if any, are some of the historical precedents of the puzzle block technique? Me either. <laughs> I think we're probably pushing it in terms of complexity at this point. I don't know that a lot of people are using it quite this way. Pretty typically, people use a puzzle block with with a, a heavy key image, like a, a wood block key image that has you know a fairly robust line. And in that case, you can put almost all the colors on one block or maybe two, and the key image would then hide the, the white line in between all of the shapes. But with this image, because there there really is no key and everything just has to has to meet up perfectly, that's that's why we ended up having to go with six blocks. But I don't know the history. I couldn't tell you the first person who dreamed it up or anything. Wasn't you? It was not me. It predates me. <laughs> um. If that's a question you want to answer or try to answer, um, so none of the none of the colors overrun each other. Like there's a minimal amount of trapping, so you make sure that there isn't any white space that shows. So that was kind of one of those things that Joe and I, when he was talking about things we had to figure out, we basically had to figure out how much of a stroke to add to a shape in Illustrator so that when it was cut away and the shape that was going to go onto it on the next run was cut away, they would they would overlap slightly so there wasn't a gap. So that was just a kind of back and forth figuring that out until we, we dialed in like, okay, it's, you know, this stroke is the, the optimal one. But is the question whether colors get layered to create other colors? Yeah, I mean, if that's the question, we didn't do that with this, but you, these are all pure colors, yeah, nothing true. sits on top of any other color, but we do do that um, often. Probably wouldn't work well in this technique because this is a tremendous amount of ink, and by the time you stack two layers up, it would be pretty, you know, pretty unappealing. Plus, we wanted to really be able to control what each of those colors were, and when you do layer colors, you give up a little bit of that control. When you say, okay, this is the yellow and this is the blue, whatever green it makes, this is like the box of colors for the I think this is for the swan image but you can see that there's little recipes on all of these cans that indicate which inks make up this color. And so when you go back after, you know, you've got the colors approved by the artist, you'll take these three colors, mix them together to get this color. You'll do a drawdown of the ink, you know, that's in the can because it'll be wet if you can get the can open. And you'll do a drawdown of this color next to the color you mix until they match. Um, somebody's asking if there's a significant cost difference between silk screen or relief, I guess. Um, in terms of how much it costs to produce it or how much they're... Maybe to just talk stuff. about, like, the difference in time each one of them might take or something like that. Silk screen is quite a lot faster, yeah. but this would have been more screens. It's, it's I don't know whether it would have come out and wash or not in terms of the amount of time that's invested. Patrick can run on that style variation two, three colors a day pretty comfortably, I think. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when I printed that run that we demonstrated earlier, 
I started that run on a Monday and finished it on a Friday on, what, 50-something sheets of paper, 60 sheets, something like that. So a dozen sheets a day, which is a lot slower. But I was throwing 15 shapes on there all at the same time. So that's a little bit hard to sort of determine um, in terms of whether the technique has any bearing on the price of the print, I would say not. Yeah. Sometimes scale has a little bearing on that. Yeah. I'm not in the price business. Um. Was it, how did you work with Derek, which was um, like to get his approval for colors and process, and how hard was it to work with him through emails and phone calls? Uh, so that was, we initially, um, you know, just referencing the painting for color, mixed all of the colors before Derek got here, because then we knew that when he came in, for the proofing, that's when we would get him to approve colors or, you know, if we had to change things. Um, that's very much in person, you know, makes it much easier. That's um, normal proofing. That's normal proofing. And the back and forth with the emailing and phone calls, that was really easy. Um, you know, just kind of talking through what we were thinking in terms of like a relief print and like how that sounded to Derek and, you know, he's, he was definitely on board. You know, right now, we we can send things through the mail, um, you know, because we, we obviously don't have artists coming to the studio right now, so that that's going to be more of how we'll work with people from now on, is, or for the foreseeable future, is we would probably print something, send it to the artist's studio, have them take a look at it, have them write notes, and send it back. Um, I mean, we can do, like, Zoom and, you know, stuff like that, and send photos, but it's just not not the same as them being able to take a look at the actual thing in front of them. That's not our normal practice. Normally, the artist comes in and you're proofing it while they're here, and you might only get two or three runs in, and they'll say, something's wrong with this. This first run, this color needs to change. And so it's faster. You don't get all the way through and send it to them in the mail. You can still catch things as you go. But that's the collaborative part. I mean, the artist comes in and you're talking color, and just, it's it's much easier and more pleasant than working through the mail, but that's going to be our reality until um, mm -hmm. things change. Um, this is from an original painting, correct? It's based on, based on an original it. painting. Uh, do you know where people could see that painting if they wanted to? I believe it's at the Hudson Museum right now. Wait, it's actually. part of the exhibition. Yeah, it's a part of that exhibition. Which is a great exhibition. Like I was lucky enough to go to the opening because uh, I was in New York because there was the Armory Show and the Art on Paper Fair, and I was helping work the booth at the Art on Paper Fair. So we went to the opening, uh, and it's amazing. So now that you know the museum is opening back up, if you get a chance, you definitely have to see the show. Somebody from the Hudson could chime in and tell us if we're correct about that. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure, sure I saw that painting yeah. there, but like. I think people are, yes, at the Hudson River Museum. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I guess that would be pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I guess, does anybody have any other questions before we sign off? Like, again, we're free, you know, Feel free, we'll totally answer any, but we also, at a certain point, probably just have one stand and look at the other one oh. awkwardly. But yeah, so any, any other questions? I'm going to say no. Okay, cool. Thanks, uh, everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks to Hudson River for reaching out to us uh, and asking us to do this. Um, have a good night.